the ability to speak at user groups around the country is nice, but I really miss seeing people in person. So if you want it, if you want to make it so I can see you and you flip your camera on, that'll make it feel like I'm not speaking to myself. So um, I've got one on so far. So thank you. Oh, great. There's more coming. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> So uh, I am going to do a tour of Go for the C-Sharp developer. And my name is Jeremy Clark, and my website is jeremybytes.com. That's where you can find me online, Twitter at Jeremy Bytes, GitHub, Jeremy Bytes, my blog, Jeremy Bytes at blogspot.com. But everything links from my website, jeremybytes.com. So if you go out there, you'll find links to the code samples and the slides and some other resources, uh, which I'll be showing a little bit later. So with that, let's head into kind of a whirlwind tour of Go. <laughs> and I want to start by saying I am not an expert in Go. So this is something that I've been dabbling in. Uh, my primary language is C Sharp, and I've been doing C Sharp since 2005. So it's been a while, and I'm fairly proficient in that. I don't call myself an expert in anything. <laughs> and I like to explore other languages from time to time because you can pick up different ideas because different environments have different approaches to things. And it some of them, I, especially in Go, there's some concepts that I find really interesting. It's like, well, is this does this make sense for me to do in my environments in C Sharp? And then there's also um, some things that have kind of, uh, I'll say C Sharp has stolen, <laughs> but you know, C Sharp steals things all the time. So one of the topics I'm going to be showing today is uh, about channels, which is a way to communicate between concurrent processes. And channels were added to the .NET framework with .NET Core 3.0. And so I've actually been exploring channels in C Sharp because of that. So, you know, there's there's always interesting stuff going on. As far as like what Go is, this actually came out of Google. And it was first released in March 2012. So it's actually been out for a while. And it was built as a general purpose language and it has a C-like syntax. So you'll see kind of familiar curly braces and things. You will not see semicolons. <laughs> I've decided no semicolons except in a few places. And then some of the features of the language, it is statically typed, so similar to C-sharp. There is also memory safety is an important thing. So Go does have pointers. So sorry for anyone who's having flashbacks to dealing with pointers, but there is memory safety built into the language. So you don't have to worry about, you know, reading, reading an address you're not allowed to read kind of a thing. Garbage collection is also part of the environment. Concurrency is built right into the language. In fact, a concurrent function is known as a go routine and you use Go to indicate that you want to start something concurrently. So that's how baked into the language it is. And then it was designed for runtime efficiency. Uh, when we build, we get an executable and uh, for whatever platform we built it on. And it is cross-platform. So this will run on Linux, Mac, and Windows. I'm using Windows today. And uh, it builds an executable, and it's really designed to be fast, nice runtime efficiency. So these are kind of the priorities uh, when the language was put together. So I'm going to build an application today, which will hopefully show off some features of Go and some things I found interesting about the language and the environment. Some of the things uh, <laughs> that we'll look at is we'll see that Go has a very opinionated syntax. So for example, where you're allowed to put curly braces, it really cares about that. Another thing is you can't have unused variables. If you declare a variable and don't use it, you get a compiler error. So a best practice is now enforced by the compiler. Like I said, baked in concurrency is there. Uh, deferred calls is an interesting concept. It's similar to like a finally part of a try finally block, but you can put it in different parts of your code. I think that's really cool. Air handling is a completely different beast. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about air handling, but I do have some articles on air handling linked in um, in the resources for this talk. Uh, Go basically has two types of errors. One of them is kind of a glorified string, and you return that from a function, and we will see that today. The other kind of error is a panic. So if you try to read off the end of an array, you get a panic. 
and a panic is like an unhandled exception and there's no way to handle it. If your application panics, it will exit. So there's no way to stop it. So air handling philosophy is a lot different. And so I've been having fun exploring that. Another thing that's cool is functions can have multiple return values. And that is truly multiple return values. Uh, we kind of fake that in C Sharp with tuples, but uh, in Go, it's just kind of natively there. And then interfaces are really kind of cool. Um, I'm big on interfaces in the C Sharp world, and that's because it was something difficult for me to learn that became very useful. So I kind of know, <laughs> uh, I won't say I know everything, but I probably know more than most people about interfaces <laughs> in C Sharp. And Go's approach to interfaces is really interesting, and I am going to show that today. So let's start out by um, looking at what we'll have when we're done today. So uh, in the code demo, and there's a GitHub repo linked from my website. And yeah, actually, let me just show that because that'll be easier. So um, my website, jeremybytes.com. And then uh, there's a link here, tour of Go for the C Sharp developer, which will take you to some resources on my website. And part of that is a GitHub repo and that will take you to a GitHub repo. And this actually has the same resources. So the articles that I'm talking, that I'll point out today, like I talked about air handling, uh, there it is, air handling, a different philosophy. These are all on the GitHub repo. And let me just paste that into the chat for anyone who might wanna take a look at that right now. Okay. So in this folder, I have an async folder. That is an empty folder. That's the code I'm going to build. And then I have a net people service folder. And this has a .NET 5 service, and we're going to be getting data from that service. So I've got another tab open that's navigated to the .NET service. So I'll just type .NET run, and that'll start up the service. And we'll look at what's in that in a little bit. And then I have another folder which has the completed application already built. And what we're going to do is um, call this service multiple times concurrently. So the service returns what, uh, what I call person objects. And in this case, we're pulling back nine person objects, but these are actually nine separate calls. And as we'll see as we go, um, we're actually calling them concurrently rather than sequentially using the uh, built-in stuff in Go. So I know, not real exciting, but we'll see a lot of cool stuff. So let me navigate to the async folder. And if I do a listing on that, the folder is currently empty. I'm using PowerShell and Windows Terminal, but you can use the terminal and command line of your choice. So I'm going to start by creating a new code file, and I'm going to call that main.go. And I use Visual Studio Code for editing because it's really good for this. So to start at Visual Studio Code, I'll type code and then main.go to create a new file. And that will pop open Visual Studio Code with my new file. And one thing I really like about Visual Studio Code is that there's a Go extension that you can install. So if you go to your extensions and just type Go, you will find it. <laughs> and this has all kinds of interesting linting and code completion and pop-up help. Uh, we'll see some of those features as we go. I would say don't try to program Go without this installed. <laughs> And I'm just going to point out, I'm actually using an older version. There's been some updates over the last two weeks that I've been having some weirdness. So like some some of the uh, stuff that it's putting in for me hasn't been working quite right. So I'm hoping they get that fixed right now. But I'm using, what version am I using? I'm using 21.1 uh, right now. <laughs> And you can install old, older versions of uh, extensions if you need to. But I'm not here to talk about that today. OK, so to start out with, Hello World is where everybody starts, right? Well, in Go, what we need to create kind of a basic application is I need 
a uh, a main function that is in a main package. So a package in Go is somewhere between an assembly and a namespace in the C sharp world. And this is um, it can be multiple files, and we can create libraries using this. But if we want to create an application, whether it's a web server or a console application or whatever, we need to have a a package main with a main function that is our entry point. So I'll start with a package main at the top, and then to create a function, I'll say func main, set of empty parentheses, and then some curly braces. So in Go, uh, this is describing a function called main that takes no parameters, that's the uh, empty parentheses, and it also has no return type. And we'll see return types in just a bit. Another thing to note is that the opening curly brace must be on the same line. So for anyone who's done JavaScript and found that if you don't put the opening curly brace on the same line and you get weirdness with some function returns, you don't have to worry about that in Go because it enforces it. If you don't, if you don't put it there, it won't compile right. So to print something out to the console, I want to use something from another package. And so I'm going to import that. And this is a built-in package, which is the format package, which is called FMT. Now, because I'm a C-sharp developer and I'm used to typing using statements at the top of my files, I often would say, okay, well, let's type in import FMT because I want to bring that in. The problem is, is that I also save my files frequently. And Go does not like you to have things that you don't use. So if I type import FMT and then save right now, it goes away. Oh, that is so annoying. <laughs> the good news is it will also put the import in for you. So if I type FMT dot and I want to use print line in this case, and now I save, it puts it in for me. So it's just one of those things, getting used to the editor, and rather than putting a bunch of stuff up front that I know I'm going to use, I just kind of let that go and uh, let it bring it in as it goes. In the C-sharp world, Visual Studio has kind of been doing this more and more and more, but it's kind of enforced in Go. And hello, world, because that's what we do. World. And like I mentioned, no semicolons. We will see a couple semicolons, but generally the lines do not end. Okay, so we have enough to build. I'm going to type go build, which will build that file. And now if I do a directory listing, I see that I have an async.exe. So it named the executable based on the folder name. So since I'm in the async folder, it created an async.exe. Another thing to note is you might notice that executable is kind of a large file. Um, it is actually, what is that, two megs? Am I doing that right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, this is everything you need. So there's no runtime. This is an executable, in this case, uh, Windows um, X64 executable. You build it on Linux, you get a Linux executable, but it is standalone. It is everything that you need. So that's a great thing about it. And then if we just run this, hello world. Is everyone impressed so far? <laughs> Very exciting. Okay, well, let's look at um, declaring some functions. So I want a set of IDs that I can use to call this service with. So I'm going to create an integer array that holds some values. So in a Go, we can declare and assign a variable at the same time. So I'm going to say, I want something called IDs, and then colon equals is the declare and assign operator. And then declaring an integer array, the uh, brackets with the number are actually in front. <laughs> so I'm going to create an integer array of nine values. And I'm actually going to initialize it as well. Seven, eight. And then when I hit save, it does all of this formatting and interesting stuff for me. So I don't really need to worry about it. 
So this ID is actually creates and assigns. Now you'll notice I have red squigglies and it's because it says, hey, you just declared this variable, but you aren't using it. So if I try to build at this point, it's a compiler error. So something that's a best practice in the development world, don't declare something if you're not gonna use it. So, cause that just creates code that's not needed. Uh, it's actually enforced in Go. Well, I will use it and I'm just going to send that to the print line. Rebuild and run. And now we get those values out. Now the format that this is coming out in is what's known as the natural format. So every type kind of has a default way of displaying itself. So we can think of this as what two string does in the C-sharp world, except generally it's more useful. If I have a custom type, as we'll see a bit later, it's not going to say, well, this is the type name. It's actually going to give us the values that are inside it. And we'll see how we can modify that a little bit later. Okay. Now, what I really want to do is I want to get values from a service. So let me flip over to my web browser. Wow, I have a lot of things open. And the service is currently running. So I'm going to navigate to localhost and it's on a custom port 9874. It's the people service and I'll say, hey, give me number three out of this. And so this is a record. It's a person object that has six properties. There's an ID, a given name, a family name, a start date, a rating, and a format string. That's seven, isn't it? I don't know. It's a number of, <laughs> of items. So I want to call this service and, uh, and uh, show the value on the screen. Now to hold this, I'm gonna create a custom type. And in this case, I'm going to create a struct that will hold the values. So to create a custom type, start with type, tell it what I wanna call it. And this is a struct. And then I'll start putting in the values or the uh, fields that I want. So I want an ID field, uh, given name, family name. Oh, give that a type. Start date, which is a time dot time, a rating, which is an int, and a format string, which is a string. Now, I want you to pay attention to what happens when I hit save. So when I hit save on line five, it brought in the time package that I needed for the start date, but then it also aligned all of the types on the struct. So these are things that just kind of happen around you as you're doing this. Um, don't be afraid of it. Just let the formatting do its thing. Okay, so let's get some data. To get some data out, I'm going to create a custom function or just a function, I should say. And we'll call this get person. And it will take an ID as an integer and it will return two values. So this function signature is a little bit more complex. So it does have a parameter, which is called ID of type int. So uh, something you will have to get used to as a C-sharp developer is the type and the name are flipped. <laughs> so the name comes first, the type comes second. And then you'll notice I have another set of parentheses after that. These are the return types. So in this case, this get person method is going to return two values. It's going to return a person struct and it's going to return an error type. Uh, we'll look a little bit more at error in just a bit, but this is actually a really common pattern. So for error handling, a lot of times a function will return da a data object and an error. And if you need to return more than one data object, the error is the, the last, um, return type that's coming back. So this is a common pattern. There's nothing that enforces it, but as we'll see in the next couple lines of code, the functions in the libraries that come with the language use this pattern a lot. So it's something to get used to. Okay, 
So I need to create a URL that looks something like this. So I'm going to do a little copy pasta here so I don't have to type that again. So I will say URL and we'll uh, create and set this. And I'm going to use another method from the format package, which is sprintf. And this will generate a formatted string. So a little bit of good news and a little bit of bad news. So sprintf is very similar to string.format. So the idea is I have a string, I can put in placeholders and have values go into those placeholders. In the Go world, these are referred to as verbs. So I'll change this three to a percent %d, which is for a, a number value, and then a comma with id. So the good news is it's a fairly familiar concept because a lot of languages use this. The bad news is there's no in interpolated strings. You know, I've gotten so used to interpolated strings in C Sharp. They are amazingly awesome. So I'm going back to learning placeholders in this case. So in this case, I've got one verb and that will stick our ID in here. And again, if I save at this point, I'm going to get some red squigglies, uh, a couple because this says, hey, you're not actually returning things. And, um, and then also I'm not using that URL variable. So I am going to use this with something from the HTTP package, which is a get and we can pass the URL into this. Um, just like, oop, not you. Um, okay. So come on, hover. Come on, hover, work with me. There we go. <laughs> uh, a lot of times to get the pop-up, you have to save and it'll bring in the import statement and then you're good. So this shows us the signature of this function. So it takes a URL string as a parameter, and this has two return values. So there's a pointer to a response, and there's an error. Now an error uh, is kind of a glorified string. And again, unfortunately, I don't have time to show details of that, but I would highly, highly, highly recommend reading the article that I have in the resources for this, because the error philosophy is really interesting going to um, grab both of those values from the returns and assign them to variables. And I can do this just like this. So just like we have that colon equals that will create and assign variables, we can use this with multiple variables as well. And if I hover over this, it'll tell me this is a pointer to a response, the resp, and er is in fact an error. Now, how do we... Uh, what do we do with these errors? Well, we check to see if they're populated. And so we'll use an if statement for this. So we'll say if error not equal to nil, and that's the equivalent of null in the C-sharp world, then we'll do something else. So the general pattern, and again, not enforced, but by convention, is that if we do hit an error, we uh, exit out of the, of the function. So in this case, I don't have an if else, I'll actually have a return here and say, hey, I'm going to return from this. Now, when I return, I need to return two values, a person and an error. I would like to say nil for the person. And um, normally I would kind of add my own information to the error type, but we'll just pass the error through. But this is not valid because a struct actually can't be nil. So instead, I need to say, Here's an empty person struct for you. <laughs> so I just created an empty person struct. And if I were to look at the, so it actually has all these properties. And if I were to look at the value of the ID property, it would be zero. If I were to look at given name, it would be an empty string. So all of the field values will be the default values for those types. Okay, so now that I theoretically have a good response, I can do something with it. And for this, uh, since we do have, uh, where did it go? Oh, since we have JSON coming out, I want to use a JSON parser. And there is a JSON package available called JSON. <laughs> 
And so uh, there's a couple ways of doing this. I kind of like this format where I say, hey, give me a new decoder. And this new decoder, uh, let me save so I get some help here. This takes an IO reader as a parameter. Now, an IO reader is actually an interface. And so it's any object that has a, a read function on it, basically, or a read method, I should say. And it turns out that the response, response body actually satisfies that. So if I hover over response body, this tells me it's a read closer. And so it actually implements the IO reader interface, and it also implements a, the closer interface, which we'll see why we need that in a bit. <laughs> So this actually will satisfy the parameter for this new decoder. But then I want to decode the, uh, the value coming back from that. And so we'll use the decode method on the decoder. Now, this is an interesting parameter that we have here, because if you see this, it says interface, and it has a set of curly braces. This is an empty interface. Now, the way interfaces work in Go is they are implicitly implemented. And so what that means, for example, the IO reader interface has a read method on it. If your type has a read method on it, it is automatically an IO reader. You don't have to specifically declare, hey, this is an IO reader. All you have to do is provide the members of the interface. I think that's pretty cool. But what that also means is an empty interface will be satisfied by any type. <laughs> so this would be similar to seeing object as a parameter in the C-sharp world. Since everything is an object in C-sharp, I can put whatever type I want in here. So let me create a variable to hold a person that I can decode this into. And since we're not declaring and assigning to it, I'll explicitly declare a variable by itself Start that with the var, the var keyword saying, hey, I'm declaring a variable. P is the name of my variable, and person is the type of that variable. And here, here's where things get fun, because I actually need to pass in the address of that value. So again, pointers, sorry. Uh, in Go, and th this is actually good, but it takes some getting used to. If I were to just pass the person variable into a, a function, then it would not be able to modify that value. It could use the value internally, but any modifications it makes to it don't survive the outer scope. So if I were to just pass in the variable itself, then person on line or the p variable on line 16 would be unchanged. If I pass the address to that variable with the ampersand, then it can modify that. So it's it's a pass by reference instead of a pass by value. And I really think that this, I, I really think of this as it behaves similar to like an out variable. So, or, or an out parameter, I should say. Um, some people say, well, it's more like a ref parameter, but I see it more like an out parameter because, you know, I'm trying to assign this thing on line 16. So, uh, that's fun. And I am not going to talk any more about pointers today. <laughs> now, this decode function does return an error. So let's do an error check here as well. So uh, we'll grab that return and say if error not equal to nil, return person and uh, error. And then if that passes, we have our happy path. So we can return our person variable and nil for the error. So this is a pretty common pattern that you'll see where run a function, check its error property, exit out or pass the error along. Um, it, and uh, again, it's not a bunch of nested if else's, it's really the if is gonna short circuit if there's an error. And so both of these are short circuiting. Now there is one more thing that I want to show here because I think this is really cool. Now I talked about how body is a read closer. So in addition to the reader interface, it also implements the closer interface. And similar to an iDisposable, we want to make sure we call the close method on the body 
when we're done with it. And so if I were to kind of do this um, in, in a typical way, I would say, okay, well, rest.body.close, I need to do it in case I exit here, and then I need to do it here. So regardless of what exit path, it gets closed. Well, this is a pain and you will miss them. So Go has this thing that I think is awesome, which is called defer. And the way this works is if I say defer resp.body.close, it will take care of calling that method anytime this function exits. So if I hit the air path on line 20, it's going to call that deferred um, function. If I hit the happy path of line 22, it's going to hit the deferred function. So um, the, the reason I like this is because if you think about uh, similar to a try finally block, this is something we always want to run regardless of it's successful or error. That finally block in C sharp is always at the bottom. That's the only place it can go. The defer can go anywhere in your function as long as you have access to this object. So this has to be after this response is available to me. But I can call this defer while I'm thinking about it and close to the code that's kind of making it a need for me to do. So I think defer is really cool. Am I getting too excited about all of this? Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm too excited. Okay, so the good news is this is enough uh, to call uh, uh, to call the service and get a value back. So we can start getting some output to our screen. Before I do that, I do want to mention something that is important on line 10, and that is the name of the function. You'll notice that the function starts with a lowercase letter. That's actually significant. <laughs> If you start a function or a type with an uppercase letter, it is exported from the package. So if someone else imports this package, which you don't do with a main normally, but if you're writing a library and somebody imports the package, anything that starts with a capital letter is exported and available for them to use. Anything that starts with a lowercase letter is only available from within the package. So there's no explicit access modifiers like public and private and protected. Instead, it's important what the <laughs> initial case of your uh, of your functions and types. So that's that's fun. <laughs> the way you figure that out the hard way is really fun. Okay, so let's output some data. And for this, I'm going to use a for loop. Now, something else that's really cool about Go is there is only one type of loop, and that is a for loop. So in C Sharp, we have for, we have for each, we have while, we have do while, um, which is great, and they all have their uses. In Go, you have a for loop. Now, the good news is you can actually use the for loop in Go as a as you would a for loop in C Sharp. You can also use it as you would a for each in C sharp. You can also use it as you would a while in C sharp. So all of those functions are in a for, and it just depends on what kind of conditions that we give to it that makes a difference. I'll start with uh, an indexed for loop. So we'll say index set equal to zero. Um, index is less than length of IDs, and len is a built-in length function, and then index plus plus. Now, uh, another thing that you'll notice is for conditionals, like the if statements and the for loops, there's no parentheses around the conditionals. This is one of the places you will find semicolons. Semicolons are used if you have multiple statements on a single line, and that's exactly what this is. We have the declaring of the index variable, the condition, and then the plus plus. So let's call the uh, get person function that we just created, and we'll pass in IDs index as a value. And at this point, I'll come back to that in a second. 
And then um, I'm not going to deal with errors at this point um, because I want to make sure that I get to concurrency because that's the cool part. Uh, so we'll do format.printf and printf, just like the sprintf, this will put a formatted string, in this case, to the console. There's also an fprintf that will put a formatted string to a file. And then there's also errorf, which is a formatted error string. So whatever you need, it's there. <laughs> and I'll go percent %d colon percent %v, add a new line character, and then we'll say p.id and p. So what I'm going to output is the ID property of the um, person and then the person itself. Now, percent %v is a verb that means it's the natural format. It's referred to as the natural format in Go. And this is, again, kind of thinking of a default two string. It's really two string because these all output strings. Now, at this point, I'm not using the error. I'm not actually checking for the error. And so I can't build at this point. It'll say, hey, you have an unused variable. Well, Go does have a, a blank identifier, and that is the underscore. So this is similar to the way we would use a discard in C Sharp. And this is explicitly saying, yeah, I know there's a value coming back. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to put this blank identifier in instead. And theoretically, this is enough to get us some data. <laughs> so let's do a go build and run. Oh, look at that. Now, you'll see that the these values are coming back slowly. And that's because the service has a built-in one second delay. And I did that on purpose for two reasons, because uh, I want to show concurrency, and it's easier to see concurrency if <laughs> the difference between coming in slowly versus all coming in more or less at the same time. So that's uh, an artificial lag that I have in here. And in the output, you can see I have one colon, that's the ID, and then inside the curly braces, this is the output that it's giving me by default for the person type. And uh, in this case, it's just the values of all of the fields that I have. There's actually another verb that you can use, which would put the field names along with the values. But um, in this case, just kind of the default is, here's the values that are coming back. Now, I want to change that. And for this, we will implement an interface. Uh, and the interface that we're going to look at is known as the stringer interface from the format package. Whenever I'm I'm looking for something and I know what package it's in, so FMT format HTTP for you know web web calls and stuff, uh, I will come to my favorite search engine and type GoLang and then the package name FMT, and that will get you exactly what you need. <laughs> and if you look on the GoLang, it's GoLang.org, then PKG FMT. So if you learn that format, you can type in the uh, URLs as well. So I'm going to go to the index and scroll down to the stringer interface. So this is an interface. It's called stringer, and it has one method in it, which is a method called string that returns a string. Now, like I mentioned earlier, in order to implement this interface, I don't have to explicitly say, hey, my person is a stringer. Instead, what I need to do is just add this string method to my person struct. And it automatically uh, implements that interface. Now, unlike C Sharp, I cannot put a method directly into a struct. A struct in Go can only have fields. But what I can do is I can create a method that is associated with this person type. So let's start with what's coming from the stringer interface. Okay. String function takes no parameters, returns a string. Okay. Func string, no parameters, returns a string. Okay. Um, great. Now, how do I associate this with the person struct? Well, what we do is um, between the func and the string, we add uh, an, a type that associates this with. And I did it again. 
So I did this talk like two weeks ago and I drew a blank on what this is called. It's called, <laughs> hey, uh-uh. it has a name that it's a uh, method. I'm gonna remember it as soon as this is over. Okay, this is fun. The second time I've done it. Um, that's gonna drive me insane. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just gonna move on and I'll think of that name of what that's called in a bit. Now, I've you might have noticed that I've kind of switched my terminology to saying method here instead of function. Go has a a clear distinction on how it uses the, these terms. So a function is something that stands alone. It doesn't actually belong to anything. A method belongs to a type or something else. So in this case, this string function that I created belongs to the person type. So we would actually say that this is a, a method on the person type. And we'll return uh, FMTS. Uh, f and i'll say percent s percent s and we'll pull out the uh, given name and the family name and so you can see this type on line 34 that i'm associating this with i get you know full code completion when i'm using it within this function and so that's how we say hey these are the properties i want to use now the fun part is what happens so all I did was add that new method to the person type. I did not make any other changes to the type itself or to any code that's calling uh, calling it. But what we see is now it uses that format as the, the default output format. So if you implement the stringer interface, this now becomes the default format that comes out. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> And I'll, I'll be exploring interfaces more in articles coming up because, uh, again, I think um, inter, uh, interfaces in Go are really interesting because of this implicit implementation. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I would like to do some concurrency because Go has concurrency built in. It's a it's a big part of it, and I want to make sure I do that before I run out of time. <laughs> So I'm going to add uh, a variable to just grab some timing on this. So I'll create a start variable which grabs time dot now, and then at the bottom I'll create an elapsed. And time has a since, so I can say time since start, and this will give me a duration. So a duration is similar to a uh, time span in the C-sharp world. And then we can output this. So FMT printf total time elapsed. And we'll just run this one more time to see that timing come in. So um, coming in nice and slow, but I want them to come in all at once. So down at the bottom, we can see that it takes a little over nine seconds to pull all of this back. So how do we run things concurrently? Well, in the C-sharp world, we deal with task and async await and a whole bunch of other things. Go has a different approach, which is, um, uh, it, it requires some different thinking than what you're used to. I actually wrote a series of three articles last week about um, Go routines, actually, yeah. So about using channels with Go routines, using a wait group, which I won't have time to show you today, and also using anonymous uh, functions, which are uh, inline functions that we can do in Go. And I won't have time for that today either. But let's talk about concurrency. Okay, so I have this get person uh, function call that I'm making on line 44. I would like to call that asynchronously. So I want to make all nine of these calls concurrently at the same time without waiting for it to return. Now what you can do in Go to create a Go routine is you can just say Go get person. This will now run concurrently. Now 
I have a problem because I can't really get the value back out of this. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, Go has this uh, concept of a channel. And a channel we can think of as a concurrent queue. So I can have one concurrent process that's writing to the channel and one that's reading from the channel. So the idea here that uh, I'll have to change some code to get to. Let me put it back where it was. Is I want to um, kick off this function uh, asynchronously, concurrently. And instead of returning a value, I want to put the value onto a channel. And I'm going to create a separate function in this case just so that we can kind of see how things work. In Go, it's common to inline this kind of thing, but it's kind of a big jump from where we are now. So I'm going to give this a terrible name, which is fetch person to channel. Really hate that name. <laughs> and we'll give it an ID. And then I'll also pass in a channel. And I'll we'll show you what this syntax means. OK, so a channel, uh, the second parameter that I have here is a channel. So it's called ch, that's the name, and then the identifier part is chan with the little arrow and person. So a channel does need a type associated with it. So a channel can only hold one type, in this case, person. And then the little arrow that's pointing to the chan, this is indicating that this function will only be putting items onto the channel. It will not be pulling items off of the channel. Is that important? Is that important? Well, it is for optimization purposes. So if I say I'm only writing to the channel, then the compiler can do some interesting things. If I say uh, I can actually just say chan person, and I'm not indicating whether I'm reading or writing, I might be doing both, and it won't be able to do those, those types of cool things. So I'll tell it I'm only writing to the channel. And let's steal this code here. And in this case, I am going to put some air handling in. So we'll say if uh, you'll notice I put in parentheses, I do that all the time. Uh, then uh, FMT. Print F. Uh, and. Yeah, print line. I'll just pass the air through. Oh, <laughs> semicolons, great. I've been doing a lot of C sharp programming this week. So if there's an error, then I want to uh, print the error to the console and then return. So I want to, again, short circuit the rest of this function. But if I get to the happy path, I want to put the person onto the channel. And the way we do that is I say channel, arrow, arrow, person. <laughs> so this is saying I'm taking the person variable and putting it onto the channel. Uh, oh, and you'll notice this, I need to change this because it's not an index into IDs. It's actually a parameter coming back. So this is something that'll be easier to run asynchronously because I won't need to worry about getting a return value back. It's just going to be kicking off this process. And uh, I'm going to create two for loops. Uh, this is to um, put uh, data onto the channel. And this one will be to pull data from the channel. Now, this is not uh, the exact where I would end up with this code, but this will show us how asynchrony works. And then we could take the next couple steps, which would be adding a weight group and probably adding um, uh, some anonymous functions as well. OK. So inside this first set, I will say go fetch person to channel, and we'll pass in the ID. So this will be IDs index. And I also need to pass in a channel. So let's create a channel variable. So we'll say ch colon equals. And to create a channel, you use the make function. And this is another function that's built in to, um, to go. And we can use it to create slices, which is kind of a dynamic array. We can also use it to create maps, which is similar to a dictionary in C-sharp, or channels. 
Now, in this case, what I've said is I want to create a channel which holds person objects in it. And the second uh, parameter is the capacity of the channel. So this will hold 10 items at its maximum. And I won't go into the details of why this is important. I would <laughs> recommend go, go look at the article um, that's linked to from the resources about channels because they're really pretty interesting. And then now that I have that, I can pass it in to my concurrent function call. OK, to read data from the channel, actually, I'll keep that line. Uh, we kind of use the arrow going the other way. So I'll create a local P variable here, and I'll set that equal to uh, pulling something off of the channel. <laughs> so pull something off the channel, put it into this person variable. And then if I save, the red squiggly should go away. Yay, I like that. <laughs> oh, OK, I feel like I should have some concurrent code here. Fingers crossed. Let's build this and run it again. Hey, look at that. So um, you can see instead of taking nine seconds like we have up here, it now takes a little over one second. So all nine of those service calls, which each take at least a second to complete, all ran at the same time. Now, uh, as you, if, if you've ever done with concurrent or parallel programming, you know, things get interesting. You'll notice that the IDs that are coming out in uh, no determinant order. <laughs> so, uh, and if we run it again, they'll come out in potentially a different order. Sometimes they come out in the same order, but that's just the luck of the draw. This is really about um, no determinant order. <laughs> Uh, so before I go, I want to show you a little bit more about these for loops just because they're interesting and it's worth it's worth this time. I actually do have a whole article on loops as well. But um, so I mentioned that this could be used like a for each or a while. Um, let's say I want to modify this a little bit. You know, this uh, for loop where we say index equals zero, index less than a length of something, index plus plus is really common. And so I could actually change this to say that I want the index to equal the range of, uh, I'm sorry, not length of IDs, but just range of IDs. So in this case, I'll still be getting the index out. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But um, it will just be based on how many elements are in this IDs. And this runs exactly the same. So I know we've known each other for an hour, but I don't know if you trust me yet. Uh, more interesting thing is that using the range, this will actually return a second value, which is the item that's in this collection. So in this case, I can get out the indexer and the actual element, more like a for each. And so if I do that, then I don't need to index back into my um, array, I can just say, hey, use this value from the array. Now, if I do save at this point, it'll say, hey, you're not using index. That's OK. We'll just use a blank identifier there. And so that way, we don't have to re-index into the array. We can just get the value. And this is exactly like a for each. If we wanted to do a um, while true, for example, uh, just leave the uh, conditional blank for opening curly brace. That's an endless loop. And so there's a lot of things that we can do this with this, which is interesting. Uh, I actually want to do the same thing down here where we'll change this to range of IDs. But in this case, I'm not using the index and I'm not using the value. So now what? Well, I could say, okay, what well, blank identifier and it'll say, no, don't do that because you're not assigning to anything. <laughs> what you can do is just leave that out entirely. So if I say for range of IDs, this will just iterate one time, depending on the number of items in the IDs array, and not actually pull any data out of that. And just to show that, we will build and run that. And uh, there we go. So, um, this is a whirlwind tour 
of of uh, of some of the things that I find interesting in Go. Another thing about channels that's um, very useful is I can you can close a channel when you're done writing to it, and then at that point you can have your reader just say, "Hey, keep reading from this channel until there's until it's closed and there's no items left in it." And so that that's an interesting thing as well. Okay, let me flip back to the slides and let's see how we did. <laughs> okay, so today's topics, opinionated syntax. So we saw things like where you put your opening curly braces is important. Um, and we saw unused variables result in a compile time error. The baked in concurrency by just putting a go in front of a function call makes it concurrent. That's really cool. <laughs> Deferred calls, which is like a finally, but we can put the statements more where we're thinking about it. Air handling, again, didn't get too much into that, but we saw some of the basic patterns of uh, a function that returns data plus an error and checking the error to see if it's nil and so forth. Uh, multiple return values baked in and interfaces, which again, implicitly implemented. I think that's kind of cool. Additional topics. So if you really want to get into Go, there's more to do. So learning more about packages and how you can create your own libraries that you can import. Uh, again, the exports thing with the capital letters and understanding how that works. Project structure, once you get Go is kind of opinionated about where you put your files. I'm not really prepared to talk about that. Uh, and then more about types and interfaces. You can actually name a return value, which is cool, and that can result in bare returns. <laughs> Uh, errors and panics, again, that's a big thing. Pointers, inline Go routines, which is using an anonymous function. Closures, so similar to um, captured variables in Lambda expressions in C Sharp. You can have closures with uh, Go, or I'm sorry, anonymous functions in Go. And then um, sync.wait group is really important when you're looking at concurrent code because it basically lets you do some signaling between concurrent operations. So you can let one operation know that another operation or set of operations is complete. So in Go, there isn't like a wait until these concurrent operations are done. You actually use a wait group for that. Now, as I mentioned, um, head out to my website or go straight to this GitHub repo and you will find these resources. And uh, again, more articles down at the bottom. Uh, loops with four, defer, error handling, multiple return values, channels, weight group, anonymous functions. So all the things that I said, there's more to learn. Uh, one interesting, one last thing I want to show you about this repo is this actually has a code tour in it. And Code Tour is a plugin for Visual Studio Code. And uh, let me just show you what that does. So if I pull down the source for this um, repo, and I'll just right click and say, let's open this folder in um, Visual Studio Code. I have another extension installed, which is called Code Tour. And um, Again, just like every other extension, it's really easy to install in Visual Studio uh, Code. And since I have that, uh, this uh, uh, set of files has a tours folder, and this is something that I created that you can uh, use yourself. And in this case, I have three tours talking about different aspects of Go. This first one talks about syntax and extensions. So if you click the little green arrow next to it, this will actually walk you through the code sample and kind of say different things about it. So this is talking about the entry point for uh, the for the application, talking about where curly braces go, talking about uh, you don't have errors on conditionals, and then here's a couple uh, interesting <laughs> samples. So if you want to kind of do a step by step through the project, and this is really the project we did plus some other stuff, including the anonymous functions and weight groups and things that I mentioned before. So I just want to put that out there, that that is available as well. So I appreciate everyone for hanging out with me today. And if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and feel free to uh, ping me on Twitter at Jeremy Bites. Uh, feel free to send me an email as well if you have a question. 
And um, I, I think go is a really interesting language. And like I said, I just wrote uh, a couple articles about channels in C Sharp this week and learning about channels in Go helped get those concepts down, but channels in C Sharp are kind of like much, they have much more functionality, which, you know, typical of C Sharp. So with that, thank you very much for, um, for joining me today. Awesome. Thanks, man. I, uh, I have a lot more to learn. I didn't realize there's so much. So I, I haven't even gotten to for loops yet. So, oh, and uh, just a little bit of trivia. Uh, I did one of the the Hello World that you did and you thought was large. I uh -huh. did it in uh, .NET Core and did the linking so it only published a single file. Uh -huh. 20, 25.8 megabytes, almost oh. 25.9 <laughs> megabytes for just a simple Hello World, but a single file. Yeah, so it's not as small compared to <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, I will post a link up to YouTube later on today. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll be able to see it. And I'll also update the meetup so that you'll be able to revisit it and um, find a link if you don't follow me. Um, and do we have any questions, any open questions? A lot of good feedback. Uh, so I think, that's all we, I think that's all we got. Thanks a lot. Have a, have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Very good.